I have a question that I think I share with a number of my viewers. The idea of celebrating Jean Desperati and showing interest in him, it seems a bit surprising as he is known as a master forger, was considered a dangerous forger and almost a threat to the hobby. Yet yep. the philatelic community seemed to embrace his work and glorify him a bit. Is that right? Well, the first thing to say is that he never called himself a forger. He called himself an artist. He said his works were art copies. One of the things that was most important for him was not fooling people, but debunking the experts. He wanted experts to be better at what they did. Uh, and that the, the root of that is something that happened to him when he was very young. Every now and then, an auction or sale takes place that re-energizes interest in a particular stamp, a country, a history, an artist, or even a collector. In this case, on December 7th of 2022, some of the most incredible items have come up for auction that are connected to an icon in the philatelic art world. And depending on your opinion, this icon was either the greatest stamp forger or stamp reproduction artist of all time. His work is still fooling the experts today. Now, this auction consists of several of the cliches or plates he developed to make these reproductions. They were thought to have been discarded and lost forever up until this auction was announced recently, which brought some excitement to the philatelic world, as we now have an amazing opportunity to learn more about the mysterious workings of Jean Desperati. And as you'll see later in this episode, I had the opportunity to speak with a couple of the philatelists from the David Feltman auction house, in which they were able to show me several of these items. But first, let's learn about this famous figure in philately. Born in 1884 as Giovanni Desperati in Italy, he later moved to France where he adopted the name Jean. And prior to his interest in reproducing stamps, he was an avid stamp collector. Then something happened that would set him on a path to become the most accomplished and revered name in philatelic forgeries. Eventually producing thousands of them, he fooled numerous experts with his reproductions of some of the rarest stamps. So much so that when he eventually announced his retirement in the 1950s, Newspapers covered the story because of his global fame. Today, his copies are highly sought after as if they were original pieces of art. To learn more about Jean Desperati, I spoke with actor and flatlist Samuel West, who has spoken about his fascination of Jean Desperati on the channel before and was kind enough to share what he had learned about the artist and his life. What's so interesting is that so many of the things that happened to him when he was young, background of his family and things that happened to him as a boy and as a teenager made him who he was, I think, over a reasonably long life. So so what was it, Sam? What was the reason for Jean picking a life of crime or art, depending on how you look at it? So this thing, this what you might call a trigger event, you know, in plays, you sometimes have a a trigger event, the thing that makes the story happen. You know, Hamlet's father dies, that the cherry orchard is going to be sold. And and for Jean de Spirati, I think that the trigger event is something he happens when he was a teenager, when he buys a stamp from the French colonies uh, and he, he buys it from a reputable dealer, presumably in Pisa, presumably also with his pocket money, uh, who assures him that it's genuine. And he takes it home to show another stamp expert who takes one look at it and says it's fake. And not even a good fake. And Jean is crushed, partly because he spent his pocket money on something that turns out to be worthless or possibly turns out to be worthless. But mostly because he feels duped by at least one of these experts who aren't experts because they've got any particular qualifications. They're experts because of their reputation. Yeah. And at least one of them is wrong. He doesn't know what to do. But at that point, I think something happens to him where he says, look, this is beautiful. This is important. I can see this detail. And somebody else can't. I don't know whether it's the guy who's telling me it's fake or the guy who's telling me it's real but one of them is lying or wrong. 
And so I think he he kind of constructs most of the rest of his life as a kind of massive gotcha. Known Sparati reproductions are available on the regular stamp market. Some, of course, are far rarer than others. This is my Salon 1885 Sparati forgery, and I would say reproduction, but this stamp never actually existed. There is a five cent surcharge of a four cent stamp like this, but not of this particular color variety described as rosy mauve. This stamp would be a one of a kind in rarity if it actually existed. Much of Sparati's stock was purchased by the British Philatelic Association, the BPA, in 1953 when he was retiring. And they did this to learn more about his processes, but also to make sure that his stock would not enter the philatelic market and fool buyers. They made sure that each of the stamps was sufficiently marked to know that they were indeed his reproductions with this hand stamp on the back, a marking that prevented them from being mistaken as genuine in the future. But how did he do it? How did Jean Desperati even have the skills to create stamps with such inimitable precision? So he's into chemistry and eventually trains as a chemist. He's got an older brother who runs a stamp shop. He's got an older brother who runs a photography business and a cousin who runs a paper mill. Now, he then decides to make his living at the intersection of those four influences. He becomes an art forger of, of stamps. Now, if he was just a really good chemist or uh, a really, really into the makeup of paper or photography, he wouldn't be who he was. He, he, he had a very amazing eye. When he was at school, he discovered when he was about 12 that he had um, the ability to forge people's signatures. And he used to forge his housemaster's signature on these um, forms that boys would get if they'd been particularly good to get an extra house point. And more and more of these slips kept turning up, presumably far more than the housemaster ever made. And I, I suppose he must have given or sold them to his classmates. But he discovered very early on that he had a talent for copying. And he would also read articles about other forgers and how they'd been found out. The perforations weren't right, the colour was wrong, the paper was too thick, the paper was too thin. For Spirati, the reasons that most copyists got caught was not that the experts were brilliant. It was that the counterfeiters weren't clever enough mm. or thorough enough or precise enough or didn't care. And none of those things were true of him. Sparati had experimented with several processes throughout his career, but his signature style combined his knowledge of chemistry, paper and photography, along with his passion for being an artist, in what was a brilliant method to not only imitate the qualities of a genuine stamp, but also a way in which he wouldn't have to create this replica from nothing, as most forgers were doing at the time. He commonly got a poorer quality version of a valuable stamp, which by soaking it in turpentine and making it transparent, he would shine a light through the back of the stamp onto photographic chemicals, producing a negative on what he called a matrix. This could be touched up to remove any other remains of postal markings and fixing any issues before using this negative matrix to produce a cliche or really a plate by again using photographic means. In his book, The Complete Technique of the Art of Philately, Jean Desperati goes into great detail explaining the chemicals, the type of glass and materials, photographic filters, and the many challenges to achieve the high standards that he was known for. Ultimately, he would print through lithographic means the stamp directly from the cliché onto paper, and his knowledge of inks meant that he was able to match the colour perfectly. But a big reason for why he was so successful in fooling the experts was what he printed the image of the stamp on. Other real stamps. Using a related stamp, usually a stamp from the very same set of the stamp that he's copying, he would bleach the image off of the paper using chemicals. For example, this Ceylon stamp was likely the rose variety that was bleached, and he did it in a way that usually kept the postmark, and in this case, the overprint intact. He would then use the cliché to print the image of the stamp on top, but by chemically understanding the porous qualities of the overprint and the cancellation inks, the new stamp image would appear to be underneath them, 
If needed, he would then lightly touch up any inks. So at the end of the day, he had a stamp that had the right paper, the right perforations, the right watermark, the right postmarks and other markings, and the right image and color as well. Every detail that a stamp expertizer would rely on for identifying a forgery. He could make a gum that would set and then crack almost immediately as if it was an old gum. It's the sort that you find on old mint stamps. He could make one that would deliberately crack so it looked old. He, he really thought of everything. I read that even though he was doing lithography, he had some success in actually imitating the raised ink of intaglio prints by printing the same image over itself again and again, which would require a tremendous amount of precision and patience. All for what? This impressive gotcha. And I mean, I think I think clearly he is he is extraordinarily driven. I mean, you would say you would say obsessed. He had this gotcha down to a fine art. He would offer stamps under an assumed name to experts. And when they offered and accepted to pay what they said were genuine items, he would refund the money and then write as himself saying, you're a disgrace to the profession. Oh, my gosh. So it's all a big it's all a big gotcha. He said, you know, if I wanted to make money, I'd be a millionaire many times over and I wouldn't live in this house when yeah. people came to talk to him. So, Sam, you were telling us last time your interest in Sparati was as a result of you being introduced to him through your own specialty that you collect. Can you tell us more yeah. about that? Yes. Briefly to say, I specialize in the 1867 two shilling blue, which because of Universal Postal Union regulations in 1880, because it was being confused with the two and a half P blue, was changed to the to the two shilling brown in February 1880. And very soon after that, the two shilling rate was abolished. So in July of 1880, I think, uh, it's recalled, in, and by the end of that year, they've destroyed two thirds of the sheets that were ever printed, and there were only a few hundred, maybe a thousand in the first place. So the stamp in any format becomes extremely valuable. I mean, a, a, a genuine unmounted mint, well-centered, to Bob Brown is thirty thousand pounds now, at least I think. Um, it's worth several hundred in any condition, and uh, I have uh, a, a few in not very good nick, but I also have a Sparati forgery. And at the point where it was offered, I thought, "Oh, I should find out more about this man." They're very slightly flatter than the genuine article. They're very slightly duller from the back. The edges of the design are very slightly more blurry, but this is under a high-powered microscope. And and then he signs the back, but in pencil. <laughs> because um, at this point, he thinks, I actually can't afford to be found out as genuinely trying to pass off fakes because it, I really could go to prison. So he signs them in pencil, which, of course, unscrupulous people rub out. Except, of course, now they don't bump them out because a Sparati forgery is worth almost as much as the genuine stamp. So people like to have them. So I have a Sparati proof. It looks like a die proof, but he didn't use dies. He just printed them. Uh, and I have two, three Sparati forgeries of the, of the two Bob Brown. It's just incredible that the forgeries are collectible in their own right. And I guess it's not just the quality uh, that makes them so desirable, but also the story that surrounds them and really the story that surrounds Sparati, including, of course, what happened to him in 1942 when he was caught. He got so good that he wanted people to know his talents. And this is where the, the trouble starts. He, he wants to become this well-known criminal. Um, he made this thing called the Livre d'Or, the Book of Gold, or the Philately d'Art, art, the Art of Philately. 225 copies of his, all authenticated by French, Italian, German, and English experts as genuine. So basically a, a roll of shame. It should be called the, the Livre de Plomb, the, the, the Book of Lead, because <laughs> if your name's in there, you're going down. <laughs> you know, you're in trouble. So, but the ultimate aim is to regulate the profession so that you know dealers would say but he's really harming the profession and i'm sure Superati, were he here would say no exactly the opposite i've got to make experts better mm -hmm. so that collectors can buy with peace of mind and so he, he did this in a way 
that where he set up, he set himself up to be caught deliberately. He sent a page from the Livre d'Or of 18 stamps, old German French colony stamps, really valuable, rare stuff, and all his copies to a dealer in Lisbon by arrangement. He then told his family to expect a visit from the police. And the police came and he opened the door and said, you've come about the stamps. <laughs> and customs had seized the envelope and the contents. And he was uh, charged in Toulouse in 1942 with exporting stamps without repatriating their monetary value, basically not paying duty. And uh, then they got a man from the local stamp club who was called Marius Gilbert from the Philatelic Club of Savoy to say that he thought they were genuine, although he wasn't qualified to give an opinion and he thought they were worth about 80,000 francs. So um, he's charged with avoiding export duties. It goes up to the criminal court. At this point, Sperati thinks, I, I might as well tell them. He explains that they're his own production and they have no monetary value. He asks for another evaluation by somebody who's better qualified, and they send Dr. Lockhart of Lyon. Uh, only the prosecutor thinks this is a delaying tactic, and he moves the case forward to the criminal court. They get Dr. Lockhart to do this evaluation, and <laughs> he comes to exactly the same conclusion as Marius Gilbert. He says they're genuine. Spirati looks like he's going to be found guilty of ex illegally exporting capital. So, and this is this is the scene in the film. To prove that they're not genuine, he brings in ten copies of the same stamps and throws them down in front of the judge. And at this point, this case is delayed and dismissed eventually, and he's charged with fraud because he's clearly been making these stamps. So he can't win. So. He's 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 fined 60,000 francs and the judgment is really horrible. The judgment says, even if the experts are wrong, the copies are so good that they should be seen as extremely valuable because they're perfect imitations and therefore they could be sold uh, as such. Um, now, this is this is where it gets really, really juicy. He's got to pay the fine. He appeals, but he's still got to pay the fine. And to and to pay the fine, he thinks of a really good idea. He makes three copies of a very rare stamp, the Oldenburg number five, with an identical cancellation. And he sells them to three expert stamp dealers without telling each of them about the other two. And they, quite, because they talk to each other, they quite quickly realize that they've each simultaneously bought a copy of the same rare stamp. And they're furious. So Spirati makes enough money from the sale to pay his fine. And he's proved that the experts were not infallible, but he's in trouble. So then the court appoints three new experts and they declare themselves incompetent, not incidentally because they're all in the Livre d'Or. Um, and so Spirati at this point writes a press release and wants to go public with it. Um, and one of the journalists who, uh, who, he, who he chooses to talk to, this is for an American collector of stamps, really interesting. Um, this, this, is, this is quite an extraordinary story. A guy called Dean Jennings visits Spirati in 1949, and he comes away with copies of some early USA stamps, a five-cent black New York from 1845, a 10-cent Jefferson Davis of the Confederate States from 1863, and a 10-cent George Washington. Massively rare, massively valuable stamps all. Uh, Spirati says, I can't give you them. Give me a few dollars. So he does. And Jennings takes them to a reputable New York dealer, who offers him 10 times what he's given Spirati for them. And Jennings says at this point, um, I think they might be reproductions. And the dealer says, no, no, I collect fake stamps. I promise, I, I stake my reputation on them being genuine. And Jennings then spills the beans. He says, listen, I, I got these from Jean de Spirati. They're definitely reproductions. And the dealer looks again, as if hypnotized <laughs> Jennings like someone who has just received a death sentence. They're perfect, he says. They're so good it makes me sick. These stamps would deceive anyone. My God, you've killed me. Isn't that great? My God.
Dude, you killed me. Sam had certainly energized my interest in Sparati and his dedication to deceive the experts. And regardless of whether or not we think of him as a forger, the work he did and what he was able to achieve was nothing short of impressive, something that I quite admired. Now that I had learned about Sparati and his work, it was time to speak with Devlin and Ricky from the David Feldman Auction House, two of the flatlists that have been working on this auction and eager to show me several of the items. So, so this is it. This is the actual document that he sent to Lisbon and got caught at the French border and then got him into all that trouble. Look at all those stamps. Yeah, because this is like the court document here, which is the, like, the listing of all the stamps. And it's funny, it's like a description. Uh, description in French of all the stamps on the, on the piece. Which was typed up by the by the expert. If you if you read the catalogue, uh, Graham, on that particular one, it it shows all the sort of official hand stamps from from the court, um, and then them sort of kind of uh, making a note that these are copies rather than the real thing. But that took them some time to do that, and Sparati spent some 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 hours and um, effort in convincing them that. That, that these were for forgeries. This is just incredible that you have this, that it's up for auction. And this particular item is what made him a well-known name throughout philately. But the entire auction is quite special, really. I've paged through the catalog, and really each item is fascinating in its own right. So there's 136 lots in the catalog. Um, some of these lots have multiple items within them so uh that, that some lots have got three or four items some have got nearly 100 items included and if you look at it it's it's kind of looks like it's his workshop R rather than like an archive if, if you want it was probably what was left behind uh, and remained in his room you know after he, he passed away and then it looks like somebody's probably got it all together boxed it up and it's been hidden away for for, for, for many years yeah, it's amazing because all this stuff is really being seen for the first time, right? His lab was super secretive. He wouldn't even let his own family down there. Uh, but like you said, it's the entire processes. It's the entire workshop up for auction, which is amazing. Devlin and Ricky proceeded to show me some of the many items that were up for auction. These included the matrices, cliches, and the very stamps that Sparati actually printed including copper plates for the red mercury, a process that he experimented with but was not happy with the results. There was one particular item in the catalogue, however, that I had to ask more about. So well associated with Sparati that you know it's going to be a highlight of the auction. It's a real delight is that we have his spectacles, his, his very distinctive binocular spectacles on offer in their original sort of wooden box. And they've got the instructions in it. And rather nicely, the, the instructions have, have, have a personal note from Sparati's daughter, where she's, she's after his death, she's given these, these spectacles, these binocular spectacles, to a family friend and said, in, in memory of our dear beloved, uh, you know, who's passed. And so anybody that knows Sparati will know these glasses. Every picture you see of him, he's got these funny little binocular spectacles. There's very on. few pictures with that, him yeah. wearing those glasses, yeah. Yeah, it was almost like he was ahead of his time in terms of marketing or promotion, you know. But today we, we, we're familiar with people having branding or some sort of iconic image, and yeah. he, he, he it. got it right. So that's a particularly sort of delightful piece to be selling. I know it's not philatelic in the sense that it's not a stamp or it's not even a forgery or a, a cliche, but it, it's it's just an iconic item which will appeal to a broad audience, I think. So that's the box. Yeah. There we go. Oh. And then, so we have them here. So I hope you put them on again. <laughs> yeah, no, Ricky, put yeah. them on. Put them on. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Famous oh, spectacles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're good, aren't they? Wow. In a way, it's a sort of item that you would expect to see in a museum on Sparati. Yeah. Know, so, and yeah. you've got the letter in there, the little note. Yeah. The... Uh, in memory of our dear deceased, and with my sincere, profound sympathy, Yvonne yeah. de Sparati, 10th of September, 1957. Yeah. Sparati died in 27th of April that year. So I suppose once the family got over the shock of it, she passed those on 
to a family member who uh, would appreciate them. One of the things that I saw in the catalog, well, at least you brought attention to it somewhere, is a mistake that Sparati may have made. Can we talk about that for a second? One of, one of, one of the items we mentioned that is unrecorded example of, of reproduction is this post post office Mauritius stamp. Mm. And one of the telltale signs that he did he couldn't get hold of a real example is yeah. the secret mark that uh, is on the, the two penny uh, reproduction. So he's, he's managed to get to a point where he's reproduced it on paper in the right shade. But if you look carefully in the bottom uh, right hand corner, there's a secret mark that was put on the reproductions that are the Royal Philatelic Society uh, issued. I think it's 1912 and 1930 or right about that. So yeah, so that philatelists could tell whether these were reproductions or not. So he he obviously didn't have a copy of the Mauritius. To, to do you think he, you think he slipped up there? You think that's a legit slip that he made? Because I mean that would have been a very easy thing for him to fix in the process. Yeah, would have been. Yeah, I mean it, that is a very interesting point. He could have easily taken it out because he would no doubt would have known about. Oh, what would he have known about a secret mark? I don't know. What do you think, Ricky? Yeah, but I, I don't think it was that well known that it was. I mean, it's not that secret because it's a bit of a dash down the line but yeah if you didn't have the original how would you know it wasn't meant to be there but that is a, you know again another unanswered question without being able to email him and say tell us what, what were you really up to but i guess that adds to the mystery that is so intriguing about him isn't it so there's so many unanswered questions are there dedicated forgery collectors like people that actually collect the work of forgers out there yeah there's a lot there's a lot of um specialist forgery collectors out there but also what you tend to find is uh you know very serious collectors will have two or three collections but they'll also have a, a, a sub collection of forgeries that's yeah. what you tend to find you, you you always get drawn into it graham it's one of those things that you can't avoid as a collector as soon as you get into it seriously at some point you're going to hit a bump in the road and go hang on a minute this doesn't look quite right what is it, it it's fascinating to think well how did this get out into the marketplace how is it past so many deaths without anybody noticing this is a forgery what's going on so then you you start to want to know about it and i think a lot of collectors uh probably never set out to be forgery collectors but uh, as they go on their philatelic journey they at some point come across a forgery that's so good they think i've got to learn more about it and so often that trail leads them to sparati <laughs> he's still fooling people today right yep there have been items that have made their way through expertising committees or uh, particularly experts that have looked at it and given it a certification or a thumbs up that it's genuine. This is 60, 70 years after his death. Yeah, we had we had one in a sale a year or two ago, uh, which was postpaid, and it came with a brand new certificate. Uh, and yeah, it was a Sparati. We hadn't noticed I won't say who. <laughs> but how did you guys notice it? Because of... Actually, you know what? Even I didn't notice it. It was a collector actually contacted us and said, oh, actually, this is Sparati. It was, it was the same time uh, Curler had a sale of Sparati and uh, had a collection of Mauritius and they noticed the stamp was exactly the same. It's Because it's actually, it's from... Because only normally you look at the Mauritius, you, you can plate them all in the... Um, yeah. What position that they were printed... So it was a position eight, I think it was, I can't remember now. Um, position 10. So, yeah, and we didn't notice until someone actually told us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it does happen. Wow. Yeah. That, okay, so that's kind of cool that an actual Sparati had made its way through that's, to you guys. That, yeah. <laughs> that you that's had to an get. expert committee, yeah. yeah. Interesting eagle-eyed collector. You know. Devlin, Ricky, I can't thank you enough for giving me a tour of this upcoming auction. I'm actually going to be bidding on a couple items that have piqued my curiosity. But the key thing that this auction has done is really given us all an opportunity to learn about this fascinating individual. There's so much mystery behind Sparati. Uh, he's clearly very, very good at his, his game. And um, we're still left with uh, trying to ask questions and, and we're still finding stuff of his 60, 60 odd years after his passing, which is incredible, really. Special thanks to Samuel West, as well as Devlin and Ricky from the David Feltman Stamp Auction House for contributing to this episode. I'm gonna leave a number of interesting links in the video description below for you to go check out and explore. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that like button and make sure that you're subscribed. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.